right. Um, thank you all for joining. We're super excited about today's conversation. So we're going to be talking a bit about some research that we have done, really trying to understand the realities of local leaders and the goals that they're trying to achieve and how we in philanthropy can support them more effectively. So we're going to be sharing some research um, and some important findings and learnings. And before we start, I wanted to have our panelists introduce themselves and share a little bit about what it is that drives their own passion to support local leaders in leading change. So Kavita, let's start with you. Salam namaste. Sorry, salam namaste. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Um, I really think that one of the most important things, watching this video for me, Denise, I think the it's just a reminder that there is a tendency in this work to think of us and them. And I think it's really important to remind everybody sitting in this room that in this country, the wealthiest, uh, wealthiest nation in the global north, there are plenty of states in which it is legal for a girl to be married forcibly often against her will um, to somebody and the age of marriage is much younger than 18. So before we even start thinking, oh, those poor girls in X, Y, Z or uh, anywhere else, let us look really closely at where we are and the privilege of spaces that we are in. And for me, that is something that really motivates me because I, I do not believe in this um, uh, unequal framing of th those poor girls in those cultures need saving from, you know, whatever the different practices are. Practices of, of patriarchy, practices of white supremacy, practices of colonialism, practices of exclusion are shared in every part of the world, no matter what the culture, no matter what the religion. And for me, that is what motivates me to do this work, is to break down the assumptions that this is somehow a problem that only affects some group of marginalized people somewhere in some other culture that it seems really foreign to us. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Siobhan Davenport. My pronouns are she, her, her, and hers. And um, before I talk a little bit more about my work, I, I have to ground us in this very question on what is my passion in engaging local leaders in the work. And for me, it's two very personal reasons. One, I am the daughter of two unmarried teen parents. I was raised by a single mother, my paternal grandmother, on a fixed income. And she did not have access to the wonderful programs that our fund supports. But what she did have was a lot of faith, a lot of sternness. I was raised in North Carolina. We called her mama, and she ruled our household. And she ensured that I was the first on our side of the family to graduate from college, but to also obtain my master's degree. And the other reason that I am so uh, passionate about engaging local leaders is that most recently, I ran a local organization for teen girls here in the DMV. And I helped bring that organization through the worst of the COVID shutdown. And of course, the families that I was serving uh, are still feeling the ramifications of COVID and the economic devastation that it brought to them and their communities. So um, I am privileged to be the program officer for the Advancing Girls Fund at Tides, where we invest in BIPOC-led organizations that serve BIPOC girls, gender expansive, and transgender youth. And I'm proud to work at Tides that is led by a black woman. We are a philanthropic nonprofit organization. And um, the genesis of the Advancing Girls Fund began at Novo, but was transferred to Tides in 2020. They still continue to fund the work. And it is just a privilege to be here and be a part of this important discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Siobhan. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Jean Bechman from Rwanda and a physician by training and graduate student at Johns Hopkins University. I have been with Rise Up since 2019 as a Rise Up leader. And what inspired me is also a question. Um, and the question is, 
what is currently the role of men and boys in sustaining the achievements that we fought for, uh, everybody in the room fought for for a very long period of time. Are we just going to sit down and enjoy the success or are we supposed to be the pioneers of uh, ensuring that sustainability to those positive changes is there? So this inspired me to start an entertainment program um, that is also a cooking show that uh, gathers young physicians in the kitchen and to practice the sense of humor and take a break from the white coat and use uh, kitchen materials for hands-on simulation to make uh, videos that are actually supposed to inspire men and boys to be the best complementary components of relationships. Awesome, thank you, Berkey. And um, it's one thing to hear Berkey talk about these videos and I can tell you from personal experience, it is very different to see them because they're amazing. So we're gonna show a one minute video clip right now, if we can. Boom! Yes, I'm going to show you the show. It's time to go. Look at that. Mwuko da shawara ukoro yu mutobe udafiti mbutu. Ninakwa da shawara kuba hubutu kuita. Hata ba yubu ura kuina anga ngore, nina anga ngavu. No, nisi kuchewe jizeo kubo nizuru. Ja, akenshi, usangabi hariru baba gore busi. Nibi kuyeye, kukona mugoro shawara kubjara, nishwara zirenze reme mungaka. Vitanu kanyenu mungabo, ushwara kutere nda. Zisaji jombi mungaka, vitoyo nubu shawazi, nubu shaka, kita bi wakuri mwana na mwaza mitsina, idachi ingeji. Ibi jose bja wisha ati kufuga ko, nda zitere kwa wangavu, zikomeje kuyo njira murugwanda. Awa gabona waba vifite muruhari. Chane rgoz, ni nayo maamvu kurugwa njira zitere kwa wangavu. Hire nga gejburuhari kwa munga mwukone zurubjaa. Nungutangi jisubizo kituzuhi. Ichichari chiganiro, ibirungo vjo kuwone zurubjaa. Tuwa haikaze, mubiche, vikulichi. Um, and if you take a look on YouTube, there are so many more, and they're all funny, and they're all engaging, and they actually talk about topics that many of us don't feel comfortable talking about, many of our communities don't want to talk about, and make it super accessible and powerful. So, you know, Berkey and also Faith and Memory, who were in the previous video, are members of a network of leaders around the world, Rise Up's network of 800 leaders, who, like Berkey, have been able to advocate for laws and policies impacting 165 million people since 2009. And so the model of the work that we do is really building power with these amazing leaders to create changes that they know are possible. And so as we've done this work over the years, we've really been seeing a shift in the conversation around building power with local leaders, around decolonization, around all these questions of what does it mean to do this work in a different and more powerful way. And, you know, conversation's important. And we also felt a little bit like, you know, we need a little less talk and a little more action. And so we decided to actually do some research with Rise Up leaders in this global network across 14 different countries to understand what were the realities that they were living in their advocacy for gender justice, what were the barriers that they faced, what were their goals, and then how can philanthropy more effectively support them. So that's what we're gonna be talking a little bit about today. Um, and just to give you kind of a high level, just a few key pieces before I jump in and ask our panelists some more questions. Um, you know, we structured it by having an advisory council of both philanthropists and Rise Up leaders themselves and alumni to really get an understanding of what were the key questions that we needed to ask. And, you know, these leaders are like so many of you, right? They're honestly most often the unsung overlooked heroes who are doing the hardest most important work that there is in our space today. And they're not getting the resources that they need. So I have my stats here so I don't get it wrong. So of this network that we surveyed, 75% said that their work is under-resourced. Another 30% said that they face political instability in the work that they do and political oppression for their advocacy. 25% uh, are dealing with patriarchy and entrenched harmful practices like you heard about around child marriage. And then 10% are facing direct threats of violence for the work that they do every day. So these are hard realities and this is hard work and I know that many of us here in the room are doing this work. And I think what was striking to me in doing the research is that these leaders, despite these incredible challenges that they are facing, 
are actually the best positioned people to be leading change. So I'm gonna ask our panelists a couple questions about that. Um, so Kavita, let's start with you. Now, as a member of the advisory council, what was it that was you know, a significant takeaway from you from the process and the findings? Um, uh, thanks, Denise. Um, I think that the, the one, I really appreciated the opportunity to be part of a shared set of conversations, including community leaders who were actually saying, these are the kinds of questions you need to be asking, and this is what we most need to hear and most need to understand. I think for me, a very important takeaway that I think we've heard at different points, and I think that Dominique mentioned so well in her session earlier this morning, was that it is not enough to simply make a grant. That the, that the experience of so many leaders on the ground, it's not only that you need to have the resources, but that you also need, and I think we saw it in the video as well, you need someone who's actually standing by you, someone who is willing to actually um, provide the ongoing solidarity that is required. That doesn't mean you fly in some technical expert from some foreign nation and, you know, uh, that drop them in, which has been a tendency in development um, for a very long time, a sort of neo-colonial model, fly in the expert from Washington, D.C. But it, what it means is that in the local communities that you build networks of solidarity, that you understand that there is more um, value in having people like, our, like Berkey and others in the communities themselves to actually talk about what works, what doesn't work, what is difficult, what is hard, um, and that you actually accompany. In Spanish, there's that whole notion of accompaniment. And I think there is um, real value in being able to kind of think about grant making in a way that is an act of solidarity that goes beyond the giving of the grant. And so for me, I found that great that actually all of the people who we surveyed, that was the number one thing that they said, was that the money is great, but we need much more than the money. And I think the, the, the piece to that that I would add, my personal sense is that often people who are in the field of philanthropy, again, we heard this earlier today, um, um, Tainisha said, this is political, right? There is no, nothing apolitical about this. So the, the fact that we stand with um, women and girls in different parts of the world means that we have to also be willing and courageous enough to stand up for them in situations that are uncomfortable for us. Oh, you're giving money to so-and-so. Oh, um, but have you heard that, you know, their government doesn't think that they are really doing good work? And I've been in too many, unfortunately, in too many experiences myself where um, when the government of a particular country changes, suddenly the people who are human rights activists and who were lauded and applauded are suddenly now the worst um, enemies of the state. And then the people who funded them suddenly are really silent. Oh, did you fund those folks? Uh, who, us? Uh, I don't know. And I think that is something we, as, as folks who are in the space of philanthropy, have to look at, take a really hard look at ourselves in the mirror and figure out whether we have the courage to stand with the activists who are putting their lives often on the line. Um, and, and it's not enough to just feel good that we gave them the money. Thank you. Um, let's see. I mean, so much to say about that. <laughs> yes, um, yes and yes. Uh, Berkey, I'd love to hear from you. You know, given your own work as an activist, doing this work, doing gender justice work as a man in the field, what was striking for you about being part of the advisory council and some of the findings and your own connection to Rise Up? Okay, thank you so much. Um, when, before I joined uh, Rise Up, I had the opportunity to work in the same industry and experienced how uh, the collaboration between the community leaders and funders uh, works. Some gaps that I realized, one that was pertaining to me was, it's like as if the relationship between a community leader and a funder is about the money that they give to them. And there is, as you just said, there is so much more that can be done. I saw it as something unique when I joined the Rise Up. Initially, in the enrollment, there was just a global call of young champions to come and join the program. And there was an incubation. We sit together as people who 
have done something relevant to their communities and then we had the exchange. You feel like you are with the people of shared goals. We learn together and we consult each other and get important insights that are very valuable to our programs. That's before the financial support evening comes in. So after the program, before um, any of the projects that I work on was supported financially, I had already started working on some of the important things in terms of planning, in terms of ensuring that the collaboration between myself and the people that I work with is thriving and working, in terms of um, looking uh, my program into the future, uh, strategizing my goals. So a lot has already changed. And then the financial assistance came in as just uh, covering the expenses to the program's uh, activities. So it's not always about the money uh, that is there as a relationship between a funder and a community leader. Uh, there is also technical assistance. There is support uh, to collaborate with people of shared goals uh, and networking with them actively. There is more importantly engaging community leaders in the partnership decision-making process. And that is very important because we know even in the regular relationship that we have, it's critical to keep the relationship uh, meaningful, respectful, and thriving. So I see that as a, a, a huge component of the relationship between a community leader and um, a, a funder or supporter or philanthropist. Thank you, Berkey. I remember um, one of the conversations that we had in the advisory council that really struck out to me was when Alejandra Garcia, if you remember from Mexico, who is an activist who works with women and trans folks living with disabilities in Mexico, was talking about how there's sort of this pendulum in philanthropy, right? And how typically many of her funders basically would come in and try to tell her what to do, exactly what you said, right? And now she has many funders who are in this whole localization, decolonization conversation and don't ever want to tell them anything to do, like don't want to impose any agenda whatsoever. And her point was that exactly what you said, this acompañamiento, right? It's this accompaniment and partnership and solidarity of really being able to work together and support one another that local leaders are really looking at. And like really seeing, one of the quotes actually that came out of the research is that leaders want to be treated as strategists and experts, not as grantees whose capacity needs to be built, right? And that, I think, is the heart of it, right? So. I, I mean, just so much of what you both said kind of reminded me of some of those points. Um, Siobhan, I want to change gears a little bit um, and ask you our next question. So how is it that Tides, and philanthropy more broadly, is really recognizing the value of bringing local leaders to the table and incorporating them in decision making in real ways? And then how does that connect to your support and partnership with Rise Up? Oh, absolutely. Well, first I have to ground the conversation that I've been at Tides now for about three and a half months. So I probably still wear my local leader hat a lot, and I've been told um, that I should never take that off, and I won't, um, because it's just so important to go into this work with that, that perspective. So, um, but at Tides, how we ground our local leaders and engage them in the work that we're doing is that um, we actually uh, surveyed all of our grantee partners. We have 150 plus partners um, in every region of the United States as well as uh, 25 plus countries in the global south. And we asked them, what do you need? How can we show up in our best light? Uh, what can we do to be a true partner, um, not just in words, but in deeds? And so our partners, grantee partners, have um, really informed our new strategy where we're focused on local leadership, we're focused on BIPOC-led organizations, and 90% of our organizations are led by uh, BIPOC leaders. And in addition, we are focused on BIPOC girls, transgender, and gender-expansive youth as well. 
So um, the reason that we are in partnership with Rise Up, I mean, you can't look at that initial video with faith and memory and not see the impact that you're making on of such a local level. And to have Berkey here as well uh, to share his work. Um, Rise Up is our, your experts at funding and f actually finding local leaders that we at Tides could never find. Not just finding them, but partnering with them. Uh, give, providing the training, the funding, building that ecosystem of, of leaders who are doing real peer-to-peer -peer learning and collaboration, and that's so key. As I talk to our grantee partners over and over again, our leaders are sharing, I'm burning out. I, um, I'm doing so much more with so much less. Uh, the partnership comes up. Obviously, funding is very important. But partner, I keep hearing that word partnership, partnership. And I know as a former local leader, it was very important to me to have the partnership and trust and relationship building and taking that time to get to know me as a person, my organization, and the young women that we served. So, um, so yes, so that is how we do it. And my belief system is you can't have trust-based philanthropy without relationship building. So it's been my goal to speak or see every single grantee partner we have and start to build that, that relationship with them. Awesome. Thank you so much, Juan. Um, so, Kavita, back to you. You know, how do you think that we can really operationalize some of these concepts, right? Because, you know, like we've said, there are these huge barriers to shifting power. We know that leaders are creating change in movements. We know that philanthropy wants to change, needs to change, is trying to change, sometimes to greater or lesser extents, right? So what are those barriers, and what can funders here in the room today concretely do to actually make a change? Thank you. I think we've heard so much about such good strategies about how we can do that um, over these last few days. And I'm so grateful to the Women's Funding Network, to Global Fund for Women, and for all of the people who've actually supported this conference. What I will say, though, is that this gathering is still an exception to the rule, mm -hmm. right? I mean, this is not where the like multi-billion dollar deals get decided. This is not where Leonardo DiCaprio and, you know, uh, Sergey Brin sit down and decide like, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to fund this. And, and I think that is just important to put on the table, which is to say that philanthropy is not a, is not a kind of the same thing across the board. It's not, it's not heterogeneous. It's, it's not homogeneous, rather. And, and I think that we have to recognize that there is there are really fault lines right now inside the field of philanthropy. It is being challenged from within. What else is the Black Feminist Fund trying to do? Um, what else are women's funds trying to do? What else is the whole notion of a more feminist philanthropy trying to do? Because we're trying to upend a system that has, quite honestly, not really had particularly strong interest in dismantling itself. Right. So if, in fact, like Audre Lord said, our job is to understand that we cannot dismantle the master's house with the master's tools, then I think we need to ask ourselves, what kind of tools do we need? What are the kinds of resources? What are the ways in which we organize? What are the forms in which we kind of take on the challenges? While acknowledging what I think Dominique said so well, right? All of us are trying to do that even as we are applying for jobs in organizations which have an all-white board, or where the family, you know, my husband always says, like, you're going to get a job in, in family philanthropy? Remember the golden rule. What's the golden rule? The man with the gold, and it is usually the man, um, makes the rules. That's, that's the truth. And I think unless we recognize that, and unless we realize that for all of our mobilization, and you know, I remember when, um, years ago, when I was at the Global Fund for Women in a different avatar, I, I found it really strange, this whole thing that all these very wealthy philanthropies with huge endowments that were invested in, like, all kinds of things, making, like, 23% a year, all that they are required to do under U.S. law is to give away 
5% yeah. of the earnings, of the earnings. What is that? What, in which world are you making 23% on your investments in, or much more, 70%, you know, at the Soros, you know, during the pandemic? Just take a look at all of those billions of dollars and what happened over there. So for me, I think, you know, the what does philanthropy have to learn is not exactly the question. Mm -hmm. It's like, just like there is a 1% in the world of how we have unequal resources, there is a 1% inside philanthropy itself. All of us who are here in the women's funds and the, we are, we are recycling and often I used to think of myself at the Global Fund as like laundering dirty money. <laughs> no, we were taking money that actually feminists on the ground would not take from anybody else, mm -hmm. but they were ready to take it from the Global Fund for Women because we were giving it in a different way. We were not putting, you know, uh, uh, the kinds of strings. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I think that there is a moment of reckoning that is coming if it is not already here, in which we have to actually ask much tougher questions of the 1% within our field, within our sector, and it is not enough to pretty that up by putting a few faces of color in your boardrooms and putting a few women of color in, you know, positions of power, and then saying, and then, of course, magically expecting them to solve all the problems, and then after they've had like exactly six months to do so, saying, oh, you know, it didn't really work, she wasn't able to do that, and next thing you know, there's like new leadership again. So for me, I think the walking the talk and making sure that we can actually hold people's feet to the fire on accountability is going to be the next really big struggle for us to do this right. Yeah. And I'm struck by that because those folks aren't here in the room. Yeah. Right? And so like we're having these great conversations and in some ways we're still the choir. Right, so how do we reach those other, how do we reach that 1%? How do we move them? How do we inspire them? So maybe that's the topic for our next panel, unless you have a quick thought on that. No, I mean, I also think that this is a, this is a dilemma for us, right? Because it's not like we, we, and I think this is something we also have to acknowledge. It's like, is it revolution? Is it evolution? Is it persuasion? You know, and I, and I think it, it is, just like we have said that it is very difficult for us to pretend that this is all kind of like, you know, we're going to hold hands and, you know, sing Kumbaya together. There is like real rage, you know. I think our communities also feel a sense of there has been so much dispossession. There has been so much just violation of basic rights. There has been uh, such theft in the name of, quote unquote, helping us. You know, most of the so-called developing world pays back much more to the West in debt repayments yeah. than any kind of philanthropic assistance that we have gotten in the last 75 years. India was one of the first countries to receive, you know, independence in 1947, and we've been paying through our noses. So I think that is something we have to figure out how to manage that balance. It's a dance. Is it a dance of anger? Is it a dance of persuasion? <laughs> is it a dance of, you know, uh, engagement? I don't know, but I also think that is where us standing, as Tanisha said, flanking movements mm. is going to be the best chance we have to get that 1% to listen. It isn't going to be because of their great generosity right. or wisdom. Right. And Berkey, so from where you sit as an activist who's doing this work on the ground, what is the advice that you have for philanthropy and philanthropists on how to really do this work in a different and more meaningful and truly building power, impactful kind of way? Okay, thank you so much. Um, I can think of three things that can be done. One is to listen actively to the community leaders. Uh, two is flexible funding. Number three is to trust uh, the community leaders. Listen actively because I believe there is a need of philanthropists to immerse themselves in the local context. And this has been discussed uh, for over and over again. <laughs> and number two, flexible funding because I think it's very hard to squeeze the implementation that is going on uh, at the community level. 
in a single pigeon hall. It, it, it's going to be very hard because there is a need of creativity and adaptability to the daily changing local demand. You know the challenges that community leaders will go, the risks that they have to take. So uh, it, it, things change like on a daily basis. So that flexibility is definitely needed. And the third one is to trust the local leaders because that's the only way you will get to understand the experiences. And a simple example, look at the families that we live in. It's hard to understand the innovations that are used in specific families to solve their own problems. Even the most neighboring family to you, you will never get to understand how they solve their own problems. So uh, trusting the way they solve problems is the only way to collaborate with them and then have that thriving. So that need is there. So listen, flexible funding, and trust the community leaders. Thank you, Berkey. So Shabon, um, last word for you. So, you know, we've been talking about how the research demonstrates that local leaders are key, right? All the partnership, all the articulate, beautiful things that Berkey just said. What's next? Like, what is it that all of us in the room, and I guess more to Kavita's point, what about the folks who aren't in the room? What should we all be working towards? Um, absolutely. Philanthropy has to catch up and get up. We need mm. to fund our feminist agenda, and we need to stop dividing our different sectors because democracy is based on the rights of each and every one of us. And so we need to catch up because the anti-gender movement is so far ahead. They're organized, they're purposeful, they're intentional, and they are dismantling our rights, uh, I would say slowly, but it's not slowly. It's happening very quickly. So philanthropy has to catch up. We need to collaborate, and we need to become much more intentional in our funding. Um, I would also say that you're absolutely right, Berkey. Active listening is key. Active listening around relationship building that leads to trust of our local leaders on the ground who are so nimble and, and moving in so many different ways. Also, I would share that we need to stop looking at quantity versus quality mm -hmm. and not look at numbers, but look at the, the depth of the work of so many of our grantee funders who may have a STEM program or theater arts program are now offering mental wellness mm -hmm. as a part of their programs because they're seeing the effects of COVID and the isolation on our young people. And so they're implementing that into their programs in order to better serve their students. So we have to do that. And then I, I have to say, we have to fund our intermediaries because we need to be able to reach our Berkeys um, and all over the world. And our intermediaries are right there um, hand in hand with our local leaders. Awesome. Thank you, Siobhan. Um, so in our last minute together, just to close, first just want to say thank you to all of you for your incredible work and for everything that you do and the incredible brilliance that you've shared with all of us today. And I actually also want to thank everybody in this room because I know that all of you, like in listening to the stories and the people I've met and the incredible panels, are doing the hardest work that there is. And I think we sometimes underestimate because we're like, oh, we're doing it, we got this, we're fine. And we're not always fine. And so just taking a minute to honor and really appreciate and sort of um, hug you from the stage for everything that you do every day because it's truly an inspiration. And I'm super grateful to get to be here with all of you and sharing it and in learning from you. So as we close, if you'd like to learn more about the research, it's on our website, which is riseuptogether.org or on social at Rise Up for Girls. Um, and yeah, thank you to the Women's Funding Network for giving us this incredible opportunity. Let's give, a, let's give another hand to this great panel. Good.